All right. Now we're going to look at the first reading for this uh, sixth Sunday in Easter time. And it comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8, starting with verse 4 and going to verse 17. It's a text about the church branching out and preaching in Samaria and the Holy Spirit coming and filling them. And then our text, but we don't, um, it's not part of the liturgical text this week time, is all that business about Simon Magus wanting to buy this power. That's where we get the word simony. To buy sacred things is simony in imitation of Simon Magus, you see? So, we're going to start now. Um, Philip, now who's he? Who's Philip? Name those seven deacons. First there was Stephen, and second there was Philip. So he's one of the deacons. And he went down to the city of Samaria. Now, Samaria is up hill-wise, but once you leave Jerusalem, you go down. To this day, uh, when a Jewish person comes into Israel to live, they're automatically citizens. They don't have to get a passport. I mean, they get a passport, but they don't have to go through any process. If you're Jewish and you come to Israel, you're, you're uh, a citizen right away. And it's called the right of Aliyah, which is spoken of as the right of return, but it's really the right of going up. Because you always go up. So you go down to Samaria. And he proclaimed the Christ to them. Huh? Now, the text, the city, a city of Samaria, is probably the city, what was by, in this time called Sebaste, uh, mostly a pagan city. Does this remind you of anything? What about when we were in Easter time and we had, uh, if you remember, we had Water Sunday, Light Sunday, Life Sunday. Water Sunday, where did the gospel take place that day? Samaria. Remember? And this for our Lord talked to that woman of Samaria. And then when we talked about they're a mixed race and they're all that. Uh, and Jesus went out to them. So now Philip goes out to them. And he proclaimed the Christ to them. He told them about the Messiah. Now just imagine the courage to go out to people. He's a Jew. He goes out there's some Jews, there's some non-Jews, the Samaritans who don't like the Jews, you know. And he starts, and he says, guess what? The Messiah has come. The Christos has come. Now, what's he going to need to uh, establish the fact? Well, this is what our text says. With one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was said by Philip. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, right away, huh? When they heard it and saw the signs he was doing. In the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, Have I not shown you all the indications of an apostle? And what are the indications of an apostle? Signs and wonders and deeds of power. That's how he done in great Patience and great perseverance. Hippomone. That's an apostolic life. Signs and wonders and deeds of power. Those are the signs of an apostle. And so here, they saw the signs he was doing. Now what kind of signs? Listen. For unclean spirits, crying out in a loud voice, came out of many possessed people. Why? The power of the word of God. Do you remember, I've quoted this text of St. Thomas several times about the power of the Word. See, the Word of God, you know, um, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Remember uh, that text? It's in Ephesians. And he says, you see what that means is, this happens frequently in sermons, St. Thomas says. Let's see how frequently we can make it again. 
You see? Because if it's really the Word of God, it's power, it's light, it's beauty, it's force. Animated by the Holy Spirit. You could you can put a book up there or put a record. Nothing will happen. It's got to come from somebody. So, uh, the unclean spirits, they can come out just during preaching. And the text goes on to say that the, the word, you see, uh, being preached, drives out the uh, congeries, the uh, tangled mass of sins and demons, if it's the word of God. So, unclean spirits, crying out in a loud voice, came out of many possessed people. And many paralyzed or crippled people were healed. All in a day's work. He's out there, a, a disliked stranger, talking about something they never heard about before. Jews, Samaritans, and pagans. How is he going to get this done? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit preaching in power. You see? So the text was on to say, there was great joy in that city. That's always what happens, huh? When the Holy Spirit acts, there's joy, right? Who's going to say, I'm really sad to see all those people delivered from demons and healed from blindness and crime. That really makes me sad. Who's going to say that? You see? And then the good news. What's the good news? God the Father is crazy about you. He sent his only son for you. And Jesus embraced all your sins and took them to the cross and came back to the Father. And if you want it, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Now that's what I call good news. And that's what the Gospel's called. Evangelio. Good news. You see? So, that's the summary of Philip's ministry. We, we have another part to go in the text. So Philip the deacon went down there, and what did he do? He proclaimed the Messiah, the Christ to them. And, and the people started to pay attention because they saw the signs and wonders, and they were gripped by the truth. They never heard of this Messiah before, you know, a lot of them. And look what's happening. Isn't that beautiful? That's the power of the word. Okay. So then it says, now when the apostles in Jerusalem, he's a deacon, remember, heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them the two heavies, Peter and John. Now where do Peter and John show up? All over the place, right? But think especially of those last chapters of the Gospel of John. Peter, John ran faster than Peter, but he waited for him at the tomb, right? Peter looked in and said, I don't know what's going on, right? John looked in and he began to believe. And there's always this. And yet Peter, Peter has been endowed with two immense gifts, courage to preach and care for the brethren. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to have you, to sift you, plural, as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, singular, you, that your faith fail not, and that you, having been converted and turned around, can support your brethren. That's his job. And he has the grace for that job. John has the grace to penetrate the mysteries. So, they went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's been probably four or five bathtubs full of ink spilled. I'm trying to get this straight. The deacon preaches. They're converted. They're baptized. There they are. So now, the apostles go to officially recognize you are Christian. But they do more. They pray over them. And they receive the Holy Spirit. And that is the seal on the baptism, okay? That grows into confirmation. But 
Confirmation, as everybody knows, and all the priests listening, and bishops especially, know it's become an orphan. Where do we put it? Eighth grade, twelfth grade? What do we do with it? You see, one of the problems is we don't concentrate on the first one. These people are believing. They're full of joy. They've seen signs and wonders, and the Holy Spirit's work completes it. Well, if the first work is never really done, there's nothing to complete. And that's why it's an orphan. If that first work is done, then the second work uh, takes place. It's completed. Now, they're both sacraments that make an imprint on the Spirit, so they're there to be revivified. Now, what revivifies them? According to Pope Benedict, it's what he calls the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The whole church, he says, should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he goes on, and this is the key. He means we become aware of what was given to us in baptism and confirmation. And so they go and they complete the work of the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Spirit completes his own work through them. But my point is, if we're, you know, we're baptizing as infants, and we got to. But any work being done to evangelize the parents, a half hour before the baptism, to people who were living together for two years before they got married, what's it, how's that going to help? It has to be catechesis. And the greatest need in the church is adult catechesis. So when they have their children baptized, they bring them up. And there's something going on in those children when the Holy Spirit comes and completes his work. And so, for it had not the Holy Spirit, it, he, had not fallen upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. It's completed now. You see? So I think the big argument about whether this is confirmation and so forth, it's, it's really a little simpler than that. Yes, it's confirming the work. That's what confirmation is. It confirms the work of the Holy Spirit. Provided there's a real work of the Holy Spirit. Then otherwise, there's nothing to confirm. Do I make myself clear? So what's the work? Evangelize these young people so that they know Jesus and love him. Then, when that work is confirmed, then they are ready to preach the gospel because they got something to say and they have the power now to say it. All right. Just a word or two about the psalm. It's Psalm 66, which is a psalm about the whole world. You have to realize that the Jews were not narrow-minded. They knew they were blessed by God, and they dreamed of the day when all the nations, all the Gentiles, would come and share this blessing. It happened, but not the way they thought, because it wasn't then that they were sort of still the head of the show, it was distributed. That's Pentecost, right? So, sing joyfully to God all the earth. See? Not just uh, Israel. All the earth. Sing praise to the glory of His name. Proclaim His glory, His praise. Say to God, how tremendous are your deeds. That's ecumenism. Invite everybody to know God and we'll praise Him together.